Okay, thank you all very much for attending today. Um, pleased to present uh, my talk on the elephant meets the whale, our friends bringing PostgreSQL to production on Docker. Um, um, and a big thank you to Postgres Open for having me and everybody else here too, so great. Um, before I go too far into the talk, I'd just like to do a real quick survey by a show of hands. How many people here have even tried Docker? Tried it out, have a pretty good idea how it works. Anybody tried actually running a production application on Docker? Couple of people. And if I may ask, does that production application, do you also have the database in a container or is it stateless? If it's stateless? We have everything but Postgres. Pretty much everything but the and that's pretty reasonable. I think right now, as people are learning about the Docker ecosystem, and, and it's a good thing to see that a lot of people here are at least basically familiar with Docker and what it does. It's a container technology, and we'll talk about it. Um, but the big question that a lot of people have is, is the database ready for containerization? Um, and I hope this talk will tell you some of the things you have to keep in mind. I think the answer, if I can cut to the end here, the short answer is yes, you can run a database in production totally containerized. You just have to keep an awful lot of new stuff in mind that you probably didn't have to worry about before you were working with containers. Um, so the answer is yes, but is it enough of a gain? Well, I don't know, and we're gonna talk about that, and let's find out. So, a little about this talk. We're gonna talk a little bit about the basics of Docker. Obviously, a lot of people here are familiar, but we'll, we'll go over what that is. And I'm gonna talk about what's the difference between a container that you're gonna run in your development box and a container that we really think, or that I really think, is production ready, is something that you could actually have out there and be confident that your database is running the way you expect it to run. This talk is not about running a large containerized environment or keeping track of orchestration methods. There are a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, tools out there that will let you manage many containers all at once, um, probably the most popular of those is Kubernetes right now, but there's also several others. There's uh, CoreOS, there's uh, uh, Mesos and Mesosphere. There's, there's plenty of ways to run containers. There's, you know, Joyent makes Smart DC. There's a lot of different things. I'm not going to talk about that. It's, it's enough to just talk about the containers themselves without trying to talk about how you'd manage the life cycle of thousands of them. Um, that said, we will talk a lot about um, containers and the Docker ecosystem. Um, so the first question, what is a Docker container? Well, I think we all know it's, it's nothing new. We've seen things like this before. A container is a way to take a process and control it. Uh, there have been a lot of things in the history of computers that do exactly this thing. Once upon a time, there was ch root. It's still a thing right now. ch root lets you um, fix the root of the operating system so that whatever you install in there can't see anything above it. It's a type of container. Very shortly thereafter, BSD released BSD jails. I think that was in BSD 4, although some BSD people could probably tell me no, it was in 4.1, but okay. Um, BSD jails, much more powerful way to do exactly the same thing, to encapsulate a process and prevent that process from affecting the other things around it. Um, and the Linux side of things, then a big project, a huge project that's been in development for a long time is LXC, or Linux Containers. Uh, Linux Containers go into the kernel space. They introduce something called C groups or control groups. And this makes process management possible to have a containerized, um, uh, 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 to have a containerized uh, application or to run something segmented off. Um, Docker itself does not use LXC, although other people might use implementations of LXC when they run containers. Docker wrote their own implementation, and they call it libcontainer. Other people who have access to the Docker source code, and remember Docker is an open source project, but it's controlled by a private company. We'll talk a little bit more about that at the end of the talk. Um, you know, perhaps we can all think of another example of an open source product that was popular but is controlled by a large company. Uh, it's something of a nemesis to all of us here, but what can you do, right? Uh, other companies that want to uh, implement containers can choose to implement their own version of libcontainer, and, and I actually believe that quite a few people out there are doing exactly that as you watch the community mailing lists. Um, Docker is simply one specific implementation of a container, but it's a very, very popular one right now. So right now when people talk about containers, you don't know whether they're talking about just Docker or the idea of Docker or the idea of containers. Odds are good that they're running Docker if they're talking about containers. They're very good because it's very popular. But as I say, there are others. 
So there's an implementation called Rocket, RKT, that is a container that has its, has its own implementation of libcontainer from the ground up. Um, so for reference, Docker is the product released by the company Docker that runs on the library called libcontainer. Other implementations that do the same thing aren't Docker, but they are containers. First question probably comes up constantly and takes a huge shift in people's thinking. We're talking about something that containerizes a process, wraps that process and allows you to run it, move it from one place to another and get reliable results. And the first thing everybody says is, well, we know how that works. That's like a VM, right? It's pretty much just a lightweight VM. No, hopefully everyone here with a little bit of familiarity with Docker at least has, has crossed this path and said, oh, Docker is not a virtual machine. Although I, I will tell you, I encounter people quite a bit who, who have used Docker and still don't really, don't really buy that argument. They think that they're running light virtual machines and they want to treat them like light virtual machines. They are absolutely not. A container is not a virtual machine. It wraps a process. It's just something that keeps a single process, ideally one process running, and keeps it protected and segmented from other parts of the application. Um, how is it different from, from, a, from an actual virtual machine? Well, a virtual machine implements the entire operating system. A virtual machine runs on a hypervisor. There is no hypervisor in, do, in Docker, meaning the, the uh, security story is very, very different. There's no init system, so no systemd. That makes some people happy. But there's no init sysv, and that makes people unhappy. There's no cron. There are no process monitors. There's no second thread to keep anything running. And there are no utilities to manage all of these containers. The container itself is just a, uh, a single, simple, um, uh, uh, um, essentially a tar file. It's a bundled file of, 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 of libraries that has a single entry point, which launches a single process at that entry point. So that entry point is a command statement that launches a thing. In our case, most likely we're going to launch the thing that is Postgres. But you could have a Docker container that launches Nginx. You can have a container that launches your custom application. Um, when you think about Docker, you think you've got this one process that's going to run around and it's got a little bit of barrier around it. So it's pretty much this. And that's you running after it saying, whoa, whoa where does it, what are you doing there? So, but at least it's contained, right? That is correct to the best of my knowledge. Yeah, it is, it, it, they, they have not contributed to kernel development that I know of. Um, so how do we get started? Again, a lot of people here have at least used Docker, so they probably know the, the basics of the Docker. Uh, there is uh, a public repository called Docker Hub. And on Docker Hub, you can find the official Docker image. Official Docker image uh, gets released in multiple different versions from 9.1 up. Um, apparently, they decided not to go any further back. I guess they're only going with uh, truly supported releases. Docker file itself um, is a text file that gets built. And we'll talk a little bit about what the lines in the text file are. Uh, um, each one of these lines in the Docker file is a layer. So I said that the whole thing is really just a tar file. And that's true. A Docker container is just a tar file. What is it towering up? Well, each line that you see here, so the very first line here says from Debian Jesse. Well, that means somewhere out there there's a container that is the Debian Jesse release of the operating system that is towered up. That the Docker container, the first thing it does is pull down and it calls that layer one. The second thing it does is run this process. Group add with the name Postgres. Let's give it a, give it a nice PID of 999. Um, other people think that that's not great, but some people think that it's great to put Postgres in there with its own ID so that they can refer to it later. But what has happened now is now you have two layers. You have two tower files. You have a small one, a large one named Debbie and Jesse, and a very small incremental difference that is only that container after you've run the group command. Yes? Can you increase the font size quite a lot? Probably. I probably can. Let's see here. Is it command plus? Look at that. All right. Um, so it's an environment variable. Even though that environment variable is a teeny line and it's just the one line, that has created another layer in your container, which is why the following line there has all of those and ands. Um, each thing that you run makes the container bigger. So if in step one you run apt-get, and then you have a separate run line further down in your run file and say, 
Well, now AppGact has created a bunch of uh, artifacts that I can remove. Um, if you do this in separate lines, your Docker file isn't going to get smaller. It'll actually be larger because it's tracking the metadata of the changes. Um, if you want it to stay small, you have to put everything on the same line so that that one layer of the file system handles all of these things at the build time of the container. So if you run app get update, app get install, and then you see right here, they're also running in the same line, rm-rf your cache. And then a whole bunch of other stuff that they want to do. That's because each one of those lines, as I say, um, uh, uh, creates a new file. Uh, those files are the, the container itself builds uh, at build time, and each one of those commands runs in order. But it doesn't mean that the container itself, if you get a container image, it doesn't mean it has anything running. There's nothing running in your container image until you run. And we'll see, let me jump to the end of the file. You'll see at the very bottom of the Docker file, there are two very important um, words here, and one of them is called entry point. The entry point is what the container will by default call as the thing that it's wrapping. Remember, it wraps just one process. In this case, it's the thing that it's wrapping is a single shell script. Um, and then we can optionally also add command to the end of it. Um, if there's an entry point, command is treated as a command line argument. So if you were at the shell right now and ran docker entry point .sh, um, it would expect some kind of default argument. In this case, the default argument is Postgres, which tells the script to start Postgres. Now, again, I did not write the Docker Hub um, Docker file, but I'm going to talk about it. Um, um, smaller base images yield smaller containers. So briefly note, uh, at the very top it said from Debian Jesse, and that's because people are comfortable installing Postgres on Debian. But there's no hard and fast rule that says you have to run Postgres on Debian. You're really just interested in the operation of the database itself. So if you can find a smaller um, base image to use, and they actually make smaller versions of Debian, for example, maybe with all the locale information stripped out. So you've got a smaller physical file. Um, you can uh, also find, say, you could build Linux from scratch and make your apps, may absolutely make your own image as tiny as you want. Now, a lot of people have already gone out and done the experiment of how a small a Linux image can they build. There's a very, very popular image out there called Alpine Linux. It's popular in embedded systems. It's popular on Raspberry Pis, things like that. Uh, and Alpine Linux, I think the smallest version of it comes down under 6 megs. Um, usually, the one people get has a couple of things in it, so it's like 12 to 18 megs. Compare that to Debian Jesse. Even a stripped down version of Debian Jesse, I think, comes in at a couple hundred megabytes. Um, so a smaller image, a smaller base image, will yield a smaller file size. But a small container isn't exactly that big a deal. You don't have to go on this aggressive desire to have containers that are the tiniest things possible. The advantage of having small containers is that they're easy to ship around, right? You can copy it from place to place. It's small. You can fit it on a thumb drive. OK, well, that's helpful. But having a small image doesn't necessarily save you a ton of things in the operating system when it's being run in production. And the reason for that is the layered file system that we were talking about. Docker is smart enough to know that it only needs to reload layers into memory once. So when you run a Docker image, the first thing it's doing is loading each one of those layers from the Docker file. Uh, and then in the active space, the topmost space, the one that's actually active, it's doing the real work. So it allocates memory for that, physical space. So if you take a 1,000 meg Docker image that it has a whole bunch of layers in it, and you, put, you have an application server, and let's say your application server needs 10 application servers. Well, if it's a virtual machine image, and you load a virtual machine image 10 times, it takes 10 times the space, right? Your virtual machine physically allocates that space, and so your one gig image is now 10 gigs of running stuff. Um, with a Docker image, if the Docker image is one gig and it can reuse 999 megs of that, it has already loaded all of those layers into memory, your total running footprint will be 999 megs plus the space it needs to run the actual topmost layer, which is probably basically nothing. So your one gig image can be loaded 10 times and really only use just slightly more than a gig of space. So some people are just aggressive about making small containers, but what does it matter if you're loading 100 of them? It, it, doesn't particularly. It does a little, but you know. So how do we run it? Well, Docker is an executable. Docker the executable runs on uh, Mac OS X. It runs on Windows now. There's a Windows native client. Uh, most commonly, Docker runs on Linux, um, and that's primarily what people, where people would run it in production. Um, but no matter where you're going to run it, it's a pretty simple command. Docker run. 
The dash D there says let's run it in detached mode instead of interactive mode. Detached means run it in the background, right? No terminal connected to it. We can give it a name, but that's actually optional. I just give it a name because it's helpful. And this last thing we have to do for our Docker image, um, dash P doesn't actually mean dash port, even though it's easy to remember it that way. It actually means publish. You're publishing one port to another, uh, 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 to, a, to a mapping. So in this case, we're saying put port 5432 on port 5432. But you don't have to do that. The thing that is managing Docker, the thing, you know, in the case of an actual Linux installation, the Docker daemon, um, exposes all of these ports as you tell it. So you could have a container, you could have three Postgres containers running at the same time that all the container thinks it's on 5432, but with a mapping command like this, you could put it at 5432, 5434, 5436, however you, you, know, well, however you want to name them. Um, and then the last thing here, we're giving it the image a name. We're saying, what image do we want to run? In this case, we're going to run the Postgres default image, and the Postgres images are all versioned, so we could just as easily run Postgres 9.4 if we want to spin something up and test it. Now, how fast can we start up a virtual machine? Pretty fast nowadays, right? Okay, you can have a virtual machine start up pretty fast with uh, Postgres installed, and then the Postgres process has to start, and the Postgres process starts pretty darn fast if there's no um, checking it needs to do, if it's, or if it goes through its wall check pretty quickly. Um, but containers start much faster than that. So we say that's nice, but containers, if I paste that in right now, it runs instantly, it's already running. As fast as I hit enter, it brought the process up. Um, how can I zoom in here? I'm not sure. Nope, that's, that's it loading the container. Um, the, so it does have the image already built. If it didn't, if it didn't know what Postgres 9.5 was, um, and I can do that by saying docker image ls to list all my images. Oh, sorry, images ls. No ls, docker images is all it takes. Um, this will show all the different images that I have available without it having to go out somewhere and find it. You can host your Docker files internally, so you could have your own repository. You don't have to go to Docker Hub. Docker Hub is a public repository, which means anybody can pull from it. Um, and the Docker daemon knows, daemon knows where to go look for it. But you could also have your own internal servers that build your own internal images. And of course, if you're running in production, you would probably want to do that. You don't want to depend on a public site. Um, and so if I didn't already have Postgres, say, 9.4, uh, although I do, but if I said I wanted to say Postgres 9.3 and I don't have it, when I say Docker run Postgres 9.3, the first thing it's going to do is check its internal list of images, say do I have that? No, then it's going to go through the list of things that I've told it are available places to go look for images. Oh, um, th that is what that is, and and. Uh, I don't know. That's a good question. Can you specify if, so if somebody were to rebuild the image and still call it Postgres 9.5 when a new release comes out, so it would have a new image ID, can you go back to the old image ID and tell it you want that one specifically? To be honest, I don't know the answer to that. I think uh, you can. You can you can call it directly by digest. Awesome. That's very good. So there we have it. Um, and then, like I say, it was running just as fast as that, so we can use psql to connect to our Docker image immediately. And there it is. It's, it's already running. Postgres is right there for us. Very nice. And of course, anybody who's used this a little bit as a developer might have already done this and seen how fast you can have a Docker instance, uh, a Docker Postgres instance, and how handy that is for doing little stuff around the development house, so to speak. Oh, I want to, you know, I want to see uh, what's the syntax of this stored procedure, and I'm going to try writing it. And oh, I wish I had Postgres 9.4 to compare. Did did, uh, did they add in, you know? Uh, what have you in that language. Well, it's incredibly handy for that sort of thing, but we're not really interested today in uh, um, how cool it is for developers. We're interested in how cool it is for production or whether it is. Natural question that people have all the time. Um, container is now running. How do I get to it? Ordinarily, you'd expect to SSH to the server. Can I do that? No, no, you can't. Um, why can't you? Because our Docker container is only wrapping one process. That process is Postgres. It's not an SSH server. If you wanted an SSH server on the box, you'd have to install that, and then also have something running in your one process that monitors these two running things and keeps them running. So now you've got three processes. You've got up, you know, uh, 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 
you know, whatever your replacement is for sysvianet or something like that that watches your two processes, then you've got your process running, then you've got your second process running just to have SSH running. Well, you, it's not the way the idea of Docker is intended to be used. Um, as I say, containers really only host one process. And in fact, why are you using SSH anyway to go to this box? Good system administrators probably know to say to themselves if they have to log on to a box, something is probably really, really wrong and they're going to make a change on that box. Well, in a Docker container, you don't make changes to a running image. If you make a change to a running image and you blow the image away, when you stop, once it stops running, you're going to reload from the Docker file. Well, it's not going to have the change you just made. It's, those, those changes you make are, are not permanent because there is no file system that lives on after the container is gone. When the container is gone, it's gone. It's gone from history. Um, if you uh, 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 want to make a change, the way you would make that change then Let's say instead of port 5432, you wanted to make it available on port 5444. Well, but that one you could do with mapping. But let's just say, um, you know, for the sake of argument, that for whatever reason you wanted the image to be reporting on 5444 instead of 5432. Um, you know, more likely you have some sort of tweak or config change or something like that. But here, you, here we say. So you would actually physically go to your Docker file and make this change manually, you would change the exposed 5432 to 5444, rebuild your image, and now any image that you do in the future will always have that change made. So if you have to SSH into a box to make one quick change, you know, you're, you know, why, why do people log on to machines anyway? Well, I'll talk about logs in a little bit and some strategies for handling them because, again, um, there's not that many scenarios where you should be, where you, want to even be logging on to running production boxes. Um, but if you really must, if you really must, you want to know what's happening on that container specifically right now, this moment, that is running. So I've got my uh, running Docker container, which I can tell by typing Docker PS, which is just like our PS command. It says that uh, Postgres is up for, for um, five minutes. And, uh, you know, I apologize. Does anybody out there in the Mac world know how to make this screen larger? Does Command Plus do it? Oh, that is so handy. Wow. No wonder they say it's so easy to use a Mac. Uh, that's, that's nice. All right. So there we go. Um, so hopefully that's a little easier to read. So it's running right now on, uh, port nine, on port 5432. So the only way I can normally communicate with the container is to connect by psql or something else that speaks the libpq protocol and would connect on port 5432. Um, but if, if I really, really want to get onto that machine to see something that's actually happening on it, I could run this command. I could um, say I'm going to docker execute, docker exec, um, dash it says to put it in interactive mode with a TTY, with a terminal that actually responds. And in this case, that's the name. Remember, we named our container PG. And I can execute one thing. Well, in this case, the one thing I want to execute is bin bash. Um, Right? You know, and some very small images don't even have bash on them, like that Alpine image. It just runs shell. And in fact, some of them have even smaller versions of, of non standard shell. Um, so there I am. Now I'm root and I'm in the box. But you see, that's very dangerous because by executing and getting into the, the container, I am root because the container runs as root. That's the design of the container. That's not necessarily. Every container would you come in as root, but that's the design of the Postgres container that you would. So I can do an LS and see stuff that's there. Oh, look, there's some files, and if I really want to. Yeah. What? Why wouldn't you use PG stat statements? Something. Right, right. So one of them is chewing up. Would, for one reason, I got a, I got a cross product going. So for one reason mm -hmm. or another, it's chewing up resources. Yeah. How would I see that process? I, I would personally look at PG stat statements first, or, or uh, no, PG no, stat. Uh, I'm just saying, kind of using typical tools. I don't want to. Well, I, I guess that would be a reason that you'd you'd you jump in with exec. You could you could use. Uh, Docker, execute, and execute top probably and get, get your screen output, your terminal output. Um, so there's not no reasons. There are very, you know, with a database server, there's probably, you know, more compelling reasons, but there, there aren't that many. Um, 
Okay. So now we've seen the official image, we've seen how quick and easy it is to run. Um, what would you want to do if you wanted something that's more than what's already in there? So somebody else already made this image for us, the Docker Hub image. It's got all that stuff in there. But one of the things it doesn't have by default, um, if I type create extension uh, PL Python U, it's going to say, I don't know what, uh, no, it's because I'm not. So we want to we want to add we want to add PL Python to all of our template databases or to our template database so that all of our future databases will have it. We'll try it. Create extension PL Python U. But guess what? They didn't include that in their apt get list, so it's not going to work. Oh look, it couldn't open the control file. And if I would type the same thing, create language Python, it's going to say there is no Python installed here. So how would we extend that image? Well, we could go to the actual Docker image, take this file, just copy and paste this file, throw it into a text editor, put that text editor, you know, put put it somewhere where you like it, and then in this list go in and manually edit where they're where they're listing all of the things that they uh, install with apt-get. And here's where they're actually installing all Postgres. They do install Postgres, obviously the major version, being Postgres 9.5. They do install the contribs, but PL Python is its own separate package in apt, so you would also have to add it. Well, you could edit this file, add it, and then build your Docker image, and it would go through all of these steps. But why should you have to? You've already downloaded the file, right? Um, and Docker works in layers, so couldn't we just extend the image somehow? And the answer is yes. Instead of using a from Debian Jesse line, you can use from Postgres 9.5. So here we have it, Postgres 9.5. It starts with that as the first layer of the image. And the second thing it does is one command. So now we have a two layer image where the first layer is actually an onion that's got you know, a dozen layers underneath it as well. But for our purposes, now we're gonna run one single command, apt-get install Postgres PL Python 9.5. And it should be just that simple to build it you go to wherever your text file is located. You would have a directory for it. Um, you could also call it an explicit path instead of using dot, but traditionally people go to the folder where it exists, the directory where it exists, and run a build command. Build really only has one argument that you can give it, which is dash t. Dash t tells it what to tag it as. So we call, you know, the official Postgres image is named Postgres and the version is 9.5. In this case, since I'm just making one for a sample, I'm going to call it pypg, and we'll also give it version 9.5. Um, and then it should come up just as simply as all of that. So here is live demo time. Everybody loves live demos, right? So here we are. Here's my Docker file. It's exactly as you saw it on the other screen. Um, just those two lines from Postgres 9.5, run app, get update, run app, get update, install. Um, and if I take my, my build statement and build it, it takes it probably the amount of time. It should, have, it should probably be able to build this here in a, in a few moments. There we go. No, well, almost. It's going to run the installs. We'll let it do that for one more, one or two more moments. I'm just going to queue up my run command here. And again, the run command is exactly like the run command I was doing before. Run detached mode, give it a name. In this case, I'll give it the same name. We'll put it on the same port, 5432, because now it's my new Postgres image. Um, it's unpacking. It's just about done there. libc successfully built. We see a message right here on the bottom that says it's successfully built, and here's the hash that it gave it. So now we can run that container. Pow. Oh, because I already have one named. I already have one named PV. There we go. So now it's running, and if I look at Docker PS, there it is, and if I go in on psql, there it should be. Could I connect to server? Is it running and accepting on 5432? Well, yeah. Docker PS says my container is still up. It is listening on 5432. Yeah, exactly, right? So what would we do now? Log on. Log on. Well, that's... That is very curious. Why doesn't it like that? So maybe I will. Let's just see what... Uh, 
Yeah, right? Because it knows. I, really didn't. I built this all last night. I blew away all my images so that I could show you at building, and then that worked, that worked last night. Um, let's say I, I want to do that then. Docker, execute, interactive, name of my container. Did I call it PG or PyPG? I guess you PG? Yeah, exactly. There are times. Yeah. Hopefully, we're not doing this in production. We're doing this, you know, in our life. But so, okay, is, is uh, Yes, and then actually yes, that's and I've got the I've got when we talk about monitoring a little bit, we'll go there. So so it's up. That's very strange. That's weird, but it had it had no problem getting to fifty four thirty two for the old container. Well, I'm not gonna uh, debug why it's not uh, why it's so it's clearly listening on fifty four thirty two. It should just it should just work as it did before, but clearly it didn't because it, it sees what's going on. But let's see what happens. Now we've built this new image that has the uh, the necessary things, and boom, we already have it. There we have it. So if I were to type create language, it would say, "Don't do that. We already you created it with the extension." So oh, see, it already exists. There we go. So theoretically, port problem aside, the port really should work. The port is exposed exactly as the port is exposed in the Docker file. It has inherited everything that the other Docker file had, except we've added one more line to it. There's no particularly good reason why it shouldn't immediately work. I have to take my word for it. I don't know. Um, and yeah, that's nice. It's, it's handy, right? That's a pretty cool way to do stuff. And now you know how to extend the image. So if you wanted to uh, add more stuff into that image so that your, your, your developer environment had more things in it, uh, that's very good. Yes, absolutely you can. Yep. Um, but the question, of course, says, I uh, remember we said that Docker is ephemeral. Um, it's only alive for as long as the container is alive. There is no data that gets written out to any actual place. It's all in this container you know, management system. So where'd the data go? Um, well, now it's time to talk about Docker volumes. Um, Docker does give the ability to map specific file areas to, uh, to, to uh, either anonymous storage um, in, the form of named in the form of volumes that are declared in the Docker file or to specifically declared places when you, when you run it. So you can map, um, uh, uh, you can map your, your physical data that exists in PG data um, from where the Docker container assumes it is, which um, if we look at this Docker file, actually I copied the relevant part right here. So they give us an environment variable called PG data and they tell us where it is, varlib PostgreSQL data, that's default in Debian location, um, but not in every operating system, obviously. So. Uh, and then it declares this next line here. It uses the volume statement and says, this volume is running. Says, Instead of treating this as the internal file system, treat this as an actual write to disk file system. Um, we can see that that is actually happening because again, our Docker process should still be running. Uh, it says it's still up. I know it's not listening, but you know. But I can look at the volumes by typing the command docker volume list. We've got some examples here of named volumes as well. We'll talk about that in just a moment, but you can name a volume and give it a specific mapping on your host. In this case, it also has this one, this one that says volume name and has a big long um, dynamically generated name like that. That's because this volume command right here doesn't tell it to put it anywhere. If you declare a volume in your Docker file, it's an anonymous volume and it will always be named in something like that. And so there's no practical way to know which volume name corresponds to which container without using um, another command line command. Um, you can say docker volume inspect and then give it the name of the volume you want to inspect. And in this list it'll tell us, ah, but it doesn't even tell you the name of the, uh, it just tells us where it actually physically mounts to in the docker host. So again, very unhelpful to actually do things this way. This is the way the Postgres default image goes, but no database administrator would trust their data exists on slash mount slash SDA1 slash var lib docker volume 00E8BDEA blah 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 blah. Not going to do it, right? Uh, so we want to figure out how we can have named volumes. I just showed you the, the, the volume list and uh, docker volume inspect. 
We can also create standalone volumes, meaning they don't have to be these anonymous volumes. To do that, we actually use the docker volume command again. Just like so, we would use docker volume create and give it a name of a plugin. One of the nice things the Docker engine has added very recently, probably in the last five-ish months, is when this guy when this came out, I think with 1.11, 1.11, um, is the ability to have pluggable data, uh, uh, plug, uh, pluggable architecture for your for your file system. So you can have a volume that exists in any of these other kinds. There's actually, if you go to the Docker page now and see the list, when they first released it, there were maybe only three or four. Now there's about 18. People can write their own volume management plugins. So you can use any kind of file system, and all you have to do then is create whatever parameter the file system demands. Like I'm sure for the Azure file system, you have to give it some kind of um, Azure user key to tell it where that goes. For the Gluster FS one, you'd have to give it the IP address of Gluster, um, and so on and so forth. But all you have to do is really type docker volume create um, dash D for whatever uh, uh, plugin, and then give it a label so that you don't have to look at names like that. Um, so I gave these labels PG data, PG log, PG table space in case I want things like data and logs and table spaces. It was just a directory entry on the host, on the parent, you know, the host file system? Give, give what an entry? Instead of, why do you need, wouldn't Gluster GX just be transparently numeric? Docker can, Docker can only see what the container can see. So if the container is running, it doesn't have access to the host. So if your Gluster FS is in your hosted environment, how does this running container over here know it exists? Um, so what you're doing here is binding the name of this value, this named volume that you can then pass to the runtime. When you run or instantiate that container, you can tell it. Instead of using the, the anonymous volume command, say, you know, the anonymous volume command throws your data into something unnamed, whatever, whatever binding you've given, it will use. It is, yes. So anonymous, volu anonymous volumes do get created in the parent system. That's It doesn't have that option. You, you, have, you have volumes, then you can name them, and then you can bind them to the run. Um, if, you, if you leave them anonymous, they go into wherever the, anonym, wherever Docker by def wherever the Docker daemon by default puts those things. Um, and so in this case, I named it pump up the volume, right? Uh-huh. So, second question. Now that we've done some, now that we got that sucker running, where are all the log files? Again, this thing is not going to live long enough. Once we turn it off, where did our log files go? Well, traditionally, when you're using Docker, what the typical answer is, they say, send all of your logging to standard out. Instead of putting anything to any kind of file, write it all to standard out and uh, collect it externally, have some sort of process that monitors all of your Docker containers and picks those up. Um, the other option, of course, for us who, are you, who run Postgres and maybe don't want to uh, uh, try and accumulate lots of text like that through some other process, we're used to going through log files and we have good tools for doing it, like pggrep from Depez, pgbadger, any number of tools that are helpful. So we actually want the physical log file so we can look at our query logs and things like that, and so why not put them on a volume? You just have to name the volume and be able to get to it. That way, once the container is gone, the volume is still there and the data is still there. Um, so there's no reason you couldn't build a PG Badger only container. If you can get PG Badger running on Alpine, you'd end up with a 24 meg image, and then you could have some external scheduler. Your running Postgres container is there. It's got the log files. It's writing them out to whatever this log partition is. A second container can use that same volume name and also map that volume. So you can have your PG Badger container run and exist exactly as long as it takes to process the log files and do some kind of management, whether you want to truncate your files or delete them, remove old ones out of the way, and then have that be gone. So now you've had, uh, once you start going with one container, you want to stack more containers on top of them. You don't want to put more processes in one container. You know, any process that is a thing you would want to do, you'd want to put that in its own container, at least according to the, uh, the sort of best practice ecology that Docker is trying to build right now. Same thing with logging. There's all kinds of plugins, just like there were for volumes. The logging, en the logging engine is also pluggable. So the default logging goes to a JSON file, just a JSON blob that comes out of Docker by typing Docker log. You can inspect it. But you could also send it to any number of other things. So syslog, Splunk, if you have the money for it. Logstash is extremely popular right now. Lots of people send their data to Logstash and then aggregate that. Uh, using something like Elasticsearch. And FluentD is very popular right now as well. Very interesting sort of solution. FluentD has really gained popularity as Docker has gained popularity. And, uh, 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 
and allows us to uh, do exactly the same thing, to aggregate large amounts of logs out of many different containers and figure out where they came from. So are we production ready yet? I mean, here we are. Here's a happy family. Everybody's really stoked. Um, if anybody knows who these characters are, they're actually not as happy as it looks because we haven't talked about all the things that we really need for a production image. All we've talked about is how to get a regular image running. What are some limitations? Well, there's no data checksums. Drives me up the wall. Who would initialize a database without checksums? Come on. Um, and there used to be, I actually didn't realize that I was writing this presentation, no control over initDB. So they had a single initDB command and that was that. But thankfully, somebody did add a Postgres environment variable where you can send initDB arguments. It's still not particularly documented and what arguments would people want to pass besides maybe data checksums and some other ones for authentication. Another limitation of the official image, the PG data volume is all on one single volume. It's nice that they give us a volume. It means you get the better uh, performance of writing directly to disk instead of to this ephemeral file system. Excuse me. Oh, excuse me. Okay. Um, but, uh, but it's all together. And of course, what are common optimizations that we do when we have large databases? We split our data apart into table spaces. We take the wall files, we put those on a separate partition, maybe even a faster storage system. We take the log files so that the log files aren't writing to the same partition. These are all things we don't want. You can't do that with the official image. Even extending the official image would be challenging. So exactly, what about wall shipping? Where are you gonna ship your wall to? If on this image, you'd have to do it all in the same place and it's, that's not good. What about authentication methods? Right now, the official image only starts up with, uh, with trust, no. Um, or you can specify a password in plain text when the image starts and then it'll use MD5. Also not great. What about certificates? What about um, dynamically generated credentials? What about any number of things that would make this usable in production? They're not there. And what about the PostgreSQL.conf? I'm running pretty low on time here, so I'm just going to gloss through a little bit here on what you could do with PostgreSQL.conf. The image comes with a default, but what if you want to change it? I believe its default is set to uh, 128 megs shared buffers. It's not what you want, right? So how would we do this in a container environment? We can't go and log in and change the files. We can't edit it because our changes aren't going to be there. One thing you can do is you can use a volume. So you can either have a single volume that contains all your files for ETC, or you can mount a single file. As in, what, during the mounting, during, during the uh, Docker run, you specify, here's your home file system, and you have a whole bunch, let's say you have a four meg memory config file, a 10 meg memory, a 100 meg memory, a you know, two gig memory, all of these different files that you've already written out as postgresql.conf. And at mount time, you pick the one you want. I'm gonna say this container image is gonna be eight gigs, so I'm gonna pair it up with my eight gig postgresql.conf, and inside Docker when I mount it, I'm gonna say that that is postgresql.conf. And the same thing would work for SSL certificates. You can have a certificate authority in one place that is a container, and you can have that you can protect your actual root root certificate and you can mount the certificate authority um, as long as they're individual files you can mount those as individual files so what do those steps look like well just as i described again you generate a simple postgresql.conf because the physical file has to exist it's already there when you init db right you'd split that uh, one way you could do this is to split the major aspects into separate files you know commands for logging wall things like that and then you'd log it and start up Okay, so now we've got that, right? We've got all these things in place, so now we're definitely production ready. No, not hardly. More about security. Well, as I mentioned earlier, the container, the Docker container, as it's built, runs as root. and uses a, a tool called GoSU, which is just SU written in Go, and they think it's more portable, apparently. Um, that means that anybody who runs this Docker exec command can come in as root. Well, what if you don't want them to do that? Well, you have to build a different image to do it. Um, what about the container itself? Well, how much memory is it gonna take? If you just run it, well, you don't know. Um, thankfully, Docker gives you a lot of commands. You can set swappiness off, for example, so it doesn't swap your pages out. You can set runtime constraints on memory, on CPU, on the actual IO weight. By default, the scheduler gives all these different disks um, certain priorities, uh, but you can change those priorities. What about high availability? Um, you know, as it stands right now, you only have one container. How would you have two? Well, you could write your own container that takes two different options. One of them would be a standard startup, and a second option would be PG base backup. You give it as a command line parameter where the primary is, and on startup, if you've given it that, uh, then it would start up and pull PG base backup. You could put PG pool in a container. You could put PG bouncer into your image so that you have pooling. Or, this is one of my favorite tricks of all time when I figured out this works, you can volume mount the PID. That means you can have a second container that speaks to it 
as localhost, it thinks it's connecting over the, uh, the much more efficient socket connection. So bypassing TCP altogether, I believe bypasses TCP. Either way, it's a more performance solution to go directly to the, to the uh, socket than it is to connect over localhost on 5432. And we can talk about service discovery, but we're not going to do that. There's a lot of organizations out there, very well-funded organizations, that are also looking at ways to do failover better than we do failover right now. Now that we have this sort of containerized world where we have lots of different nodes and witnessing nodes is a thing, there are other people out there, for example, Joint has a project called Manatee, Red Hat has a project called Project Atomic. What about backups? I'm sorry, I'll go back one so we can see that. What about backups? Well, you can do snapshots of those volumes on the actual operating system. You could build another container to handle your backups. You could put backrest in a container and give it a bunch of cores if you wanted to, so you would have a different number of thread, a different number of cores than your actual operating system, than your actual Postgres one. And I mentioned backrest, it's popular because it does incremental backup, and it's neat, you know. Um, what about monitoring? Well, monitoring, you're no, really, no longer really monitoring a single host. You're monitoring um, your, your running Docker implementation. You have a Docker stat command. If you run it, it'll show you what the CPU is of any container. Stats. There, Docker stats. And this gives you a top-like view, but it doesn't show you the individual threads. It shows you what this container is doing. Um, C Advisor is a free product from Google. I highly recommend it. It'll give you a lot more information than stats. It gives you graphs. It gives you a nice UI. And then, of course, there's popular um, hosted solutions out there. Um, can you run StatsD? Could you run another agent? You know, some sort of some sort of monitoring thing. One process per container is a purely arbitrary standard we've set. Well, the answer is yes, for exactly the same reason that we could, if we wanted to, run an SSH server. But now you need something to watch the two processes. And of course, you have to remember, if you put it out on a port, you have to, in the Docker file, mention what the port is. So now we're production ready, right? What have we done? What have we done? You were so busy wondering if you could do it, and you never stopped to ask if you should. Well, um, there are a lot of challenges with Docker. First of all, we all imagine if we're keeping track of lots of containers that we have this super awesome thing. But we don't have this super awesome thing with cranes and ships coming in. What we have is a whole bunch of containers and no idea where to put them, what to do with them, what do we do next. Right now we're looking at containers one at a time and trying to think of how would we manage that. How do we deal with failure? I don't even know. What if the whole thing starts tipping over? You know, something else comes along, your entire Docker host goes down. You have new challenges and new troubleshooting techniques you have to learn if you're going to do it. Poorly understood security. There's our friend Elliot again. He's, he's, he's telling us that all of the systems are hackable. And nobody knows how hackable Docker is. The Docker host, nobody has really explored so far how badly you could compromise a Docker host if you get access to one container. People who understand C groups a lot better than I do could probably get in and own your system. You don't want them to do that. What are some other problems with Docker? Um, well, it changes very rapidly. It has a rapid release cycle. When they release new iterations of the Docker host, they're not compatible with the old iterations. The community is kind of falling apart because it's owned by one large megalomaniacal, megalomaniacal company. Maybe not evil, but just has their own idea of what to do, and they're not particularly community friendly at the moment. Um, I mean, they are. They accept some contributions, just not enough. And of course, remember that Docker is an implementing, uh, is a standard I'm sorry, Docker is not a standard, it's just an implementation. So I'd like to leave you with one thought, if I could. When we're kids and we think about things that are super exciting, how do kids play with exciting things? Everybody runs in a big cluster and tries to kick the ball, right? We all want to be the guy who kicks the ball. As you get older, you realize the game has a lot more going on. You, know, you don't want to be the kid running up and trying to kick the ball in production with all the other kids running up and, and, and going after it. Docker is the soccer ball. We're all the people running up to it. But if we're more prepared, we want to take a couple steps back and play more of a long game. So with that said, thank you very much. Obviously, I've run us out of time for questions, but uh, um, I'm here for the next two days, and I'll be at the, uh, the event this evening. So if anybody wants to talk about Docker or containers, anything like that, um, I think they're super enjoyable. And I've barely scratched the surface of what you could do in production with a Docker container. So thank you very much, Postgres Open.